Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm sure most of you already know me, but just in case you don't, I'm Stacey. I am the Chamber Engagement Manager and um, welcome to our next episode of Lunch and Learn, the Living Room series. I'm clearly in my living room, so yay. Um, and I guess the intention behind these this series was to really help empower our members with knowledge that will hopefully, hopefully make you better business owners. So in the spirit of that, I'd like to introduce to you our incredibly knowledgeable, <laughs> lovable, and occasionally inappropriate Catherine Horse. Yeah, I'll deal with that. <laughs> she is a barrister and a solicitor, a business influencer, a social entrepreneur, and a media personality. So take it away, Catherine. And can drink like a fish and pole. Oh, yes. Yeah. But- <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. So just let me bring that up. So that means now everybody should uh, be able to see the PowerPoints. Yep. Which is good. And then I'll just get rid of everybody else. And there we go. Okay, so um, throughout it, at the end of each topic, what I'll do is I will come back and see if there is any questions or if anybody has any. Um, If you think of some as I'm going through, please use the chat box. Um, I'll, you know, come in and have a look at that. Um, And then at the end of each topic, what I'll do is I'll just ask anybody if they've got any questions. Um, You know, obviously this isn't legal advice, it's very general. Um, The idea behind the Business Owner's Guide to the Law is really to allow business owners to start to understand the legal environment in which they work. Because over the past 30 years in law and also in business, it's probably one of the key areas that business owners probably don't pay enough attention to. Um, And it's one of the key areas in which businesses find themselves getting into trouble quite a lot. Um, You know, COVID has, I think, one of the the good outcomes in a sense, has actually focused quite a lot of business owners' attention on such things as contracts and the need for contracts. Um, And whilst we think some things will never occur um, after this year, we'll probably stop saying that as often as what we do. So this is just going to run through a whole heap of different topics. Um, It's about business structures, leasing, employment law, which has become, you know, a hot topic as well, intellectual property, contracts. So it will give you a taste throughout it. Um, You know, we do have an hour. You should have received workbooks and also an e-book that goes with these slides. So that also gives you material you can go back and look at as well. So in terms of myself, I run something called Aquarius Consulting Group. So I run law firms um, as the principal solicitor. I also have a Master's of Adult Education, so hence why I'm very passionate about empowering business owners to understand Um, legal advice and the legal environment Um, and I also sit on a number of boards and advisory boards um, to assist with compliance in a number of business areas. So you the PowerPoints I'm happy to share those Stacey at a later stage as well with people. Um, You've also got the ebook and you also have the workbook. So um, if you don't have copies of the last two um, We've given Stacey um, the the material, so please feel free to to email her um, as she's lying in her living room and she will be able to to help you out there. So the first topic, in a sense, that I'm going to talk about is actually business structures. And I always love this topic because generally people, you know, when I ask them what their business structure is, I get everything from I'm a company as a sole trader or I'm in a partnership with my wife, but I'm a sole trader. I get a myriad of different answers 
And I'd say probably only about 20% of those answers are actually true. The, the newest, you know, buzzword is everybody's um, in a joint venture. And I think if actually anybody actually understood what the joint venture meant, they'd probably run a mile by that point. So what I, I like to start with is a business structure is like the key foundation. Now, I'm talking about business structures slightly different to what an accountant will. An accountant will be looking at it as profit sharing, as in your um, income, as in tax minimization, all of those things. When I am looking at it, what I am looking at is your liability and responsibility from a legal point of view. So we do come at it from slightly different um, views. The other thing is that from my view, there is no perfect or key, you know, there's no absolute brilliant business structure. Every single one of them has an advantage and a disadvantage. So the first one I'm going to um, talk about is sole trader. Now, this is probably the one that, you know, for most service providers in particular, some retail start off as. So that would be literally the simplest form of business structure. It's where you can commence business in your own name. Um, you receive all the profit. You make all the decision. You don't require um, any real, you know, government approvals. You've just got to be responsible for your tax. Um, obviously, if you're running a, a business, you know, like an electrician or where you need your own licenses, all of those, obviously. But there's no registration required as there is with a company with ASIC. Or, so basically, you get your ABN, um, and if you're going to invoice over $75,000, and off you go. So, you know, it literally is money in, you know, and it is your money at that point. So, you know, the good thing is that, you know, it is very simple to start off with. Um, you know, there's some disadvantages, but as well. And one of those is that you have all the responsibility. So even if you are, you know, if I'm Catherine Hawes trading as Pole Dancers Incorporated, Pole Dancers Extraordinaire, even if everything I do is, you know, in that trading name, I am still responsible for the debts. I'm still responsible for the lease. If somebody injures themselves, I'm the one being sued. And I'm sued personally, okay? There isn't any structure to hide behind. My personal assets are at stake as a sole trader. So again, I say to people, you know, if you are in an industry where, you know, it's very little risk or you're not looking to grow your business, so you're not looking to have employees, you know, maybe leases, you're not looking at borrowing money, any of those things, and a sole trade is fine. So for a number of my clients, you know, they one of them's a photographer. She does about 10 weddings a year. You know, she earns the money mainly for the family holidays. Um, for her, sole trader works perfectly. It, you know, it's very simple structure and not a lot of paperwork behind it. The next one is partnership. Now, with partnership, this is where people get themselves um, into trouble very quickly when you allow other people, even though you think you're a sole trader, into your business. Partnership is actually defined by something called the Partnership Act. If you need to go to sleep at night, I really suggest you, you read it. But otherwise, what the Partnership Act defines a partnership as is two to 20 persons carrying on business in common with a view to a profit. 
So if your business structure looks like that, doesn't matter what you call it, it's going to be a partnership. You know the old saying, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, guess what? It's a duck. Well, if there's two of you in business, your profit sharing, decision making, um, you know, all of those things that looks like a partnership, then it's going to be a partnership. So this generally arises a lot um, over the, well, I've actually seen it arise a lot because a lot of us are now collaborating with others where, you know, we may be bringing people into the business, um, you know, and then we start to profit share, we start to do this, we start to give them empowerment about business decisions and suddenly you find yourself with a partner. Now, the problem with a partnership is that you're then liable for all the debts of the partnership, okay? So people say to me, oh, but shouldn't it be 50-50? Well, no. So if the partnership owes the, you know, ANZ Bank $100,000, A and B, who are in the partnership, are equally liable for $100,000. The reason I say that is because, let's say A goes out and blows all their money, um, you know, at the casino, then B is left holding the debt, okay? Partnership is personal responsibility, personal assets, again, at stake, okay? It's not what we call limited liability. The other thing is when you are collaborating with people, try and avoid the word partner. You know, you see it, I particularly had it in an event um, management situation where the event management company said they were in partnership to bring you this event. Well, that meant they got stuck with the debts at that point. So you really need to be very careful how you use that word. And unless it is a deliberate attempt, you know, or a deliberate intention to be in a partnership, don't be using the word, okay? Because it just brings up a whole heap of grief that you really don't need. The other thing is be very careful. The two words, I say to business owners to always keep in mind um, is control and protect. So are you controlling your business? Are you protecting your business? So by allowing, you know, somebody to come into your business and, you know, really be seen as a co-owner or a partner, um, you need to make sure that that has rules around it there's an agreement around it and it is done very consciously, okay? Otherwise, you can be opening yourself up for a world of hurt. That's particularly true whether, you know, whatever type of business you're in, but particularly if your business, you know, revolves around clients, customers, client lists, intellectual property, you need to start to protect your, your asset and your business. I'm not a great fan of partnerships um, because there is that um, unlimited liability. You're attached to somebody, valuing it if you want to get out of it can be, you know, more difficult. Um, in divorces and, and family law matters, partnerships are much more open for, you know, um, to, to lose what you've built up. So I'm not a great fan of partnership. I think the next one that I talk about, which is a corporation or a company, um, if there is going to be a number of you in business, and, I do, and by that I mean even if it's family members, you know, even if it's a husband and wife, even if it's your cousin, your brother who you die for, um, when money comes at stake, you may want to kill them. So I would strongly suggest, you know, a company where there is structures, there are shares, and quite frankly, a company has the very important of being limited liability. 
So in a company, you're, there's directors and there's shareholders. So let's start with shareholders. Shareholders' role is to provide um, money, you know, to provide that capital investment. Shareholders don't have a lot, well, they have very, very little say in the management of a business, okay? So you might have 10 shareholders. That doesn't mean you've got to have 10 directors, okay? The role of a directors and that board of directors or the, whoever it is, is to guide the company, is to have that overall management of the company to make the day-to-day -day decisions. So corporation from an individual's point of view provides you more protection because your personal assets aren't at stake, although that has been watered down in recent years quite a lot because you know banks require directors guarantees that is you're guaranteeing the money um, the other is that you know when you know your leasing directors also can be held responsible because it'll be a director's guarantee so directors in in whs and a lot of areas are being made responsible but, you know, that we still have something called the corporate veil. So it's not a given, but in some areas you do need to be aware of your responsibilities as a director. Um, basically what the court says is if you are a director of the company, as a minimum, okay, as a minimum, you must know the company finances, you must know what the company does, and you must attend and be involved in the decision-making process. So gone are the days where people used to say, oh, you know, I was a director, but I didn't know what was going on. Um, that does not cut it anymore um, with the court. They're saying if you're a director, you need to understand your liabilities. So... Um, Okay, so when we talk about non-for-profits, um, I don't actually deal with those in, in this because it's not really a business structure. I mean, the whole concept of non-for-profits is that you, um, you know, you're not there to make a profit. Um, therefore, things around, you know, taxes and all of that are differently structured. However, even if you are in a non-for-profit, there is a difference between incorporated and unincorporated. Incorporated provides protection to those in the NFP um, and it would always be, you know, much better to have those protections and that limited liability. So lots of non-for-profits obviously do employ staff. They do um, have, you know, leases and assets and all of that. And it's really important the directors of those understand um, at times they still may be held liable. So that sort of falls into that category. So before I move on to, oh, I've been on it so long, it doesn't want to move. Um, leasing, does anybody else have any questions around the three partners, the three business structures. No, I can't actually. I had a quick question regarding trusts. Yep. yep. How that fits into these three structures. Okay, well, a trust isn't technically a business structure. It's an asset protection structure. Okay, so if you are, so with a trust, you would have a corporation as the trustee, generally of the trust, okay? If it is a discretionary trust used for business. So there's different ones. There's family trusts, there's testamentary trusts, and then what I will term the corporate trusts, okay? So a corporate, so you would set up a company and that company would then manage the trust. Right. Okay, so... That's 
trust themselves, you know, are a vehicle rather than a structure in themselves. Right. So if I'm the trustee of As an individual? a family trust yep. that is operating a business, um, how does the, yeah, this is where it got a bit confusing as to I'm a trustee for a family trust in which I'm operating a business. Okay. So I'll just do quickly trust. So okay. generally in trust, it's, it's a bit of a triangle. Okay. So you have what we call the set law, which is the establishment of the trust. You have a trustee and then you have beneficiaries. Okay. So if you are a trustee of a trust, you cannot be a beneficiary of that trust. Right. Okay. If you, if it is a corporate trust and you are the director of that corporation, then you can be a beneficiary. Even if it's a family trust. Yes, because the thing is the trustee is not meant to have any interest in the trust. That's the whole point of it. Right. Okay. So I, mean, I can't give my, so otherwise it's just a circular, like it, it, so the trust has to manage the money on behalf of what we call the beneficiaries. Right. Okay, I might have to have a chat um, later on. Yeah, so look, you know, um, yeah, because that's the whole idea of, because otherwise, why would we bother setting up, like it wouldn't make sense. Well, it was originally set up as a family trust for asset separation in that yep. it held a property that was rented but I received benefit and I was a trustee. Okay, so maybe let's have a off that offline. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I don't want to yeah. derail this meeting. Um, that's all right. Yeah, no, I'm just in, because, you know, the thing is that lots of people have set up trusts, there's self managed super fund, like there's bear trust. It's, it's a complete area in a sense in its, of its own, um, but it's generally not like you can have a trust that owns the business, but it would generally be managed by a corporate trustee. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll um, take, I'll talk to you offline. Yep, now. yep, yep, no, happy to help. All right. Thank okay, you. so now I'm just going to put you all back there and let's see if I can do this. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on leasing, um, except the reason I put it in here is that people enter into commercial leases without actually getting the lease reviewed, okay? A commercial lease, you really need to think about the fact that, you know, you're entering into a lease for maybe three, five years. You are responsible for that rent during that time. Your commercial lease needs to be reviewed you know, who's responsible for the fire extinguishers? Who's responsible for the roller door? Who's responsible for the air conditioning maintenance? Does it have the right DA for the, you know, what you want to run? So, for instance, a client of mine um, sent me a lease all hot to trot. I think she was about to move in and she wanted to run a bakery. And I said to her, well, it doesn't have a DA for that. You don't have the right licences for that. You'd have to, like... There is a whole heap of things. So I know we all get very excited about our businesses, um, but commercial leases in particular, you need to work out what you're responsible for as the tenant. Um, and in particular also, what they call the end of lease clause or the mend and make clause, um, can be really nasty. You know, you might be up for recarpeting the whole of the um, property again. So commercial leases are a contract, okay? Yes, there's templates. Yes, there's, you know, standard things. But all of that can be renegotiated, re-agreed between the parties. So don't think you're just stuck with your commercial lease. Retail leases are different. Retail leases have their own um, act. Um, you know, there's a whole set of rules around it. And generally, these will be your shop businesses, you know, whether you're in Westfield or Macquarie Centre or whatever it is. So these are a lot more detailed, generally. 
a lot more specific. And, you know, from my point of view, generally have a lot more protection for the tenant than what a straight commercial lease has. Um, but again, you need to be sure that, you know, what the real estate agent or the landlord has sent to you um, is actually what is in that lease. So just be very mindful also with commercial leases. Um, I've noticed a lot around Sydney now have a demolition clause. So I was actually reviewing a commercial lease. Um, they wanted to set up a swim school. So a huge amount of investment by the tenant into this property um, because they, they had to comply with a whole heap of regulations. Um, and they wanted a lease guaranteed for 12 years because that's, you know, was the, the point at which they would have all the return. The problem was that there was a demolition clause, which meant on six months' notice, without any compensation, they could be told to move. It was in an area where, you know, there may be development. So for them, it was too much of a risk. But without having that reviewed they could have been in the situation that you know four years into their lease there is a um you know a demolition and they have to be out so without any compensation so just something to be very mindful of now one of the key areas which you know i love and everybody else seems to hate um is contracts okay it seems to be that people don't like the word contract. I don't care if you call it an agreement, your terms and conditions, your service provider. I, what it is, is an agreement about what you're going to do, what your clients, customers are going to do. Okay. So it is that legally enforceable agreement. So a contract is between two or more persons. Lots of people you know, say to me, oh, we only did it verbally. It doesn't matter. Well, you know, unfortunately, verbal contracts, you know, if proved to be a contract, are just as enforceable as written. Don't get me wrong. They're a lot harder um, to discuss. They're a lot harder to talk about. They're a lot harder to prove. But, you know, you still may be holding yourself open just by those conversations. So this is also why a contract is really important in your business. It makes it clear. It makes it um, understandable. Uh, it just takes out all of those disputes that generally arise. The other thing is that it also means that you're very clear on what you need to provide. So, for instance, I had a client, again, it was an event management situation where um, I was for the event manager. Her, she entered into a contract with a florist um, or an agreement with a florist via Instagram photos. So their entire agreement was what the enchanted forest for the one-year-old's birthday party should look like. I didn't know one-year-olds were so keen on greenery. But the whole dispute came about, about you know, how much greenery should have been provided for the amount that was paid. Now, okay, we weren't talking large sums, but for small business, any sum is a, is a large sum. But it's also about the angst, the time it took everybody away from their business. And it just should have been, if it had have been, you know, a simple terms and conditions or a simple contract, it would have been a lot simpler and everybody would have been able to do their job a lot better. So a contract actually has three things. So it's an intention to create legal relations. It has an agreement and it has consideration. This is what the court looks at to see if a contract has been made. So just because you've come to agreement doesn't necessarily mean you've got a contract. So for instance, if you agree with your teenage um, child that they're going to clean up their room for $10 a week, um, the good news is that they can't take you to court. Generally, the court will view those as family and that you don't necessarily intend 
to create that legal relationship. So if anybody's promised their kid a car at the end of the HSC, good news is they can't sue you. Um, bad news is they probably still want one. Agreement is the fact that both parties have, have come to an agreement of what the terms are. Consideration is there must be an exchange. Okay, it can't just be, so both parties must bring something of value and it must be exchanged. Doesn't necessarily have to be money, but it would generally be something like, you know, it could be I'll mow the lawn for your mountain bike. That is still one party bringing a mountain bike, one party bringing, uh, one party doing the action and the exchange occurring. So that's what the court looks at to see whether or not there is actually a contract. Now, you'll probably notice that, you know, all day, every day, we would in business be entering into agreements that would fit this criteria. It's really important that those agreements are documented. Very few of us can probably remember what we had for lunch last Wednesday, um, let alone a conversation we had with somebody five years ago about what work they were going to carry out. So very important that all relationships should have a contract. So what I, I need you to sort of think about is your business in the middle. Okay, so what you'll have is upstream contracts and then you have downstream contracts. So what I call upstream contracts are people that you need to have work done in your business. So it might be a photographer, it might be a web designer, it might be a PR person. Um, you know, so these are people that are coming into your business, maybe a supplier of goods that you then on sell. So these are people coming in, you need agreements with. You know, what are they expectations? What are they meant to be doing? What are you paying for? What do you get at the end? You then have what I call your downstream or the, the contracts that, you know, come out of your business in a sense. So that would be with your contractors, subcontractors, employees, um, your customers or your, you know, your suppliers. So whoever you are then doing your business or work for, you need a contract about then what you are doing and what they need to do. So all of those relationships need to have a contract. So obviously some of the benefits is that it just stops that misunderstanding. Okay, it also means that it gives you a bit of control. And I'll give you this as an example. I do a lot of work for um, architects and, and those involved in the building game at that third tier. Now, one of my clients, you know, they were really distressed because what would happen is they would do some drawings for a client, send it to the client, and then there would be silence until probably two days before the DA ran out and suddenly everything's urgent. And at that point, they then have five other people that everything was urgent. So their ability to manage their work was just ridiculous. Um, so what we did for them was we put into their um, service agreement or their, their contract with their, their clients that if a response was not received within a two week period, then they would not be held responsible if timelines were not met. Okay, so if the client delayed, it wasn't going to be the architect's issue. So this really started to empower them and make their workflow much better and take away a lot of that stress. So contracts do more than just, you know, make sure you get paid. Okay, they can be really powerful to start to, you know, set your work priorities and be very clear what you are liable for. So people say to me, well, what should we put in our terms and conditions or our contracts? You know, well, first off, what products and services are you, going, are you providing? 
So, you know, if I go back to my florist and event manager, I'm going to provide X amount of flowers or I'm going to provide this or, and this is the cost, okay? I'm going to provide a one-hour consultation. This is the cost, okay? Very important that you also put in payment terms. And, you know, again, I was doing this for a wedding um, event manager and she would get a deposit up front and then after the wedding, would send an invoice for everything else. Now, I said to her, do you think it might be a good idea to do it before the wedding? Because by this stage, they've probably already blown their budget, they're on their honeymoon, and the chances of you fully recovering just diminish day by day. So we put, you know, a much better system in place so that she wasn't chasing debt all the time. The other thing in there, particularly if you provide services, um, is termination of those services. So surprisingly, I, I, I sat clients, um, actually this week I probably sat a few, but that is because in my terms, you know, if I find that you're not telling me the truth, you're not doing what I say, you're hindering the case, then you're out, okay? Similarly with my architects, if you don't provide the material in this time or you continue, you know, to change parameters or you become too difficult or whatever else it is, terminate, okay? You do not need to be stuck with a time wasting just because you've got a contract. Very important that you have termination in there. It's also very important that you have in there um, exceptional circumstances. So, and I don't just mean COVID when I talk about that. Um, and I do do a, a whole series on contracts and what needs to be included. But, you know, there's a whole heap of things that you need to protect your business and yourself. Returns policies. Um, yes, if you provide goods and services, but mainly goods I'll talk about. Um, you do need a return policy, okay? You need to send, and it needs to comply with the Australian consumer law, not what happens in Facebook groups, where I see all the time you don't need to return. If an item is not as described, does not work, is faulty, has a major defect, you need to have a policy about returns, okay? No question. And... You know, don't try and use the one that, oh, without a receipt. No, it's just proof of payment. You don't need the receipt. The other one I love is when they say to me, oh, it's not in its box. Uh, that's not in consumer law either, okay? Does not have to be in the box. Although I'm still having great difficulty getting that through to my mother who keeps every box, I think, since about 1970, um, just in case she has to return it not what needs to occur. So these are some of the things you particularly need to put in to your contracts. And as I said, I do, uh, you know, have a full contract session. Definitely these are the essential documents, okay? If you're going to run a business, you need to protect it and you need to take ownership of it and you do that by having contracts and agreements in place. Okay, any questions from anybody? Everybody's still alive. We're still, okay, I see a few people nodding, so that's good. Um, it's always a bit harder when everybody's um, on a screen because I, I don't see the horrified faces as much as when I'm talking in person about, oh, shit, I should do this. Um, okay, so look. I've, I've included just a, a little key point on e-commerce um, because I know a lot of us have had to take our businesses online um, and some of us very quickly. So, look, just some key points on this. Um, you know, definitely don't make any misleading claims on social media about your product or service. Okay, so don't tell me that Elle McPherson uses your hand cream if she doesn't. 
Um, you know, don't tell me Arnold Schwarzenegger does this if he doesn't use your product, okay? Um, for your websites, every website needs a privacy policy, website terms and conditions, okay? Um, it's a must. Now, people go to me, well, what are website terms and conditions? Basically, this isn't your customer or your client service agreement, okay? If you hop onto a website, there will be information there. If you hop onto a website, they may have cookies. They may be collecting data. All of that is what goes into website terms and conditions, okay? It is not about your clients. It is about having a website and how that website operates and what people need to know when coming on it. The other thing you need is a privacy policy. So this is particularly um, in this day and age, all websites um, need to comply with the European Union law, um, which I know sounds odd when we're sitting here in Australia, but European Union says that any European citizen is entitled to the same protection anywhere in the world. So if you have a German sitting in Singapore looking up an Airbnb of looking up a bed and breakfast in Katoomba, that Katoomba website will need to have EU compliant privacy policy. So there is, in a sense, no escaping that in this day and age. Um, privacy is probably the growing area where consumers do want to know how their information is being collected, how it's going to be used. So having a privacy policy really, you know, is becoming an, an essential part. Um, and then you need to think about how you're going to collect, store, you know, or if you do, and then how you manage that. So um, really important that all websites have those documents. Um, and you think about how. The other area I just wanted to touch upon, because this is an area where a lot of business owners don't necessarily think there's a value, okay? Um, however, you know, surprisingly, Victoria's Secret stopped ringing me a while ago um, in order for me to do any catwalk modelling. So the only thing I've got to rely upon now um, is what's in my little noggin, um, and in my head. So my intellectual property, the way on which I conduct these seminars, the way in which I have forms for intake, all of that has a value, okay? So when we talk about intellectual property, look, there are others, there's patents, there's design. I'm not gonna go into those because that's sort of a whole other area. But I do want you all to think about as business owners, Copyright and trademark. So copyright, I love it when people go to me, I had that idea. I should be earning that. Yeah, well, it's not about having the idea. You know, my husband has the idea of doing the kitchen every day. It doesn't do it. It's about that tangible, okay? So if you have an idea and you then put it into practice, then that can be covered by copyright. So in particular, things for a business owner are your precedents, your manuals, um, your copy, your articles, your brochures, all of that, um, you know, is yours, okay? Key with copyright is it must be original, okay? So, you know, it has to have, have originality about it and, you know, it still needs to be artistic. The problem with copyright is there's no registration of it. So what I generally suggest for people is to be very mindful of um, other people taking their material, maybe set up a Google alert um, for some of your keywords. Trademark, on the other hand, is exactly like what the word says, the mark of your trade. So. You know, if I say Nike, everybody thinks of the tick. If I say Coca-Cola, people think of the bottle or the ribbon writing. Trademarks, okay? Think of McDonald's and the whole thing is a trademark. So really 
<coughs> when we're thinking about it, it identifies your product and service, differentiates you in the marketplace. Okay. Trademark, particularly now in our online world um, and in our global world, really does have a value. Um, and it also means you can protect. Uh, so, for instance, I have a client who has a unique system that they've trade and they've trademarked the name of the actual sling or product um, that takes yachts out of water. So, what they they found was their competitor was hashtagging that trademark on Instagram to get more followers. And we were able to stop that. So trademark is, is really a key to protecting a lot of your intellectual property around how people identify your products and services. If you're going into any joint ventures, if you're going into any collaborations, really important that intellectual property is covered in your agreements, okay? Um, because otherwise you may find at the end of it, you're left with very little um, and that can be a huge problem. So strongly suggest that as a business owner, you start to even do an inventory of intellectual property, um, you know, and then have we think about how we're going to protect that. It needs to be in your contracts. It needs to be in your employment agreements. Um, it really is an important part of protecting your business. Catherine, I'm going to interrupt for one yep. second. It's Stacey. Um, I've just seen that there was a question that came through on the chat room and I know yep. you had just touched on e-commerce, so I'll go with it. And Christina is asking, what type of insurance should you have for e-commerce stores selling goods? Okay. There, okay. So first off, um, you know, in a sense, I, I'm not in insurance broker or person, I would strongly suggest seeing one. But as a general answer, whether you're selling goods on e-commerce or whether you're selling goods at a store, it's the same insurance. You are liable for those goods. Um, and what a lot of people in Australia don't realise is that if I buy through you, I, it doesn't matter where you source that from, I don't have a relationship with them. I bought it through you. So anything goes wrong with it, if it harms anybody, does damage to anybody, guess who I'm suing? Okay, I'm not suing the person that you bought it from or you are contracted with. I'm suing you. So it doesn't really, the, whether it's an e-commerce or a, 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 a physical shop, it really doesn't matter in terms of your liability. Obviously, if you're in a shop, you've got people coming in and you'd have to have public liability um, for that. But you definitely need to consider having insurance to cover yourself if somebody sues you. You also need to ensure that you have a very good contract with whoever is supplying you your goods. So I hope that answers that question. Christina there. Yeah. Okay. So the other is one of the key things that I find a lot of business owners with copyright trademark don't do is also look at confidential information, okay? Your list, when you do an audit, um, your list of your suppliers, your list of clients, um, you know, your contact list all need to be protected um, and you need to ensure that happens. So, for instance, in employment contracts, you know, if people have LinkedIn pages, who owns those contacts? My employment contracts, I own them. They're going out representing my firm on my time that I pay for, then they're my contacts. So you really do need to start to think about some of that. Now, um, in terms of social media, okay, again, there's a whole um, series I do on social media law, um, but one of the key things is that you really need to ensure that if you have a web page 
Facebook page, whatever you have on whatever social platform, as a business owner, you are responsible for everything that's written on there. So if you can't manage the 30 different social media platforms, don't have them, okay? You are responsible for posts, public comments, okay? So just be very mindful of that. Um, now, most marketing people um, in social media will say don't delete. Um, I say delete. Delete is your friend um, because delete may mean you don't have to come and see me. So just be mindful that, you know, just like anything else, you are responsible for your business and what is said on all of those pages. So, you know, my suggestion is probably not put the 12 year old in charge of your social media. Um, and if you cannot keep up with it or cannot manage it, then you really have a think about it. Also, you know, if you are seeing people to redo your website or to do landing pages or any of, um, you know, sales funnels, just be really clear that you're not about misleading the consumer, okay? Because otherwise you can face very harsh fines. Um, if you've got employees, I would strongly suggest having a social media policy. Um, you need to ensure that you control your business image. So in mine, we don't have, nobody can be friends on Facebook, any social events, only can be shared from our own page. So they cannot put up any of their own photos in relation to a work social or, or event. Um, so heavily controlled and, you know, when I do the social media, talk, there's reasons behind that. But you definitely need to control and protect your business and having a social media policy is definitely one of those ways. Um, employment law. Okay, because I know we're getting close to the end, but I just, lots of people talk about contractors and employees. Okay, this is clearly going to set how you tell the difference. So imagine that I have a chauffeur who, ha who has a car that I provide, a uniform I provide. I'm, and the uniform is a pink bunny suit and he turns up in his pink bunny suit and I direct him, you know, about how clean the car should be, what needs to be in it, the route we're going to take, his starting time, his finishing time, okay? If I give those same instructions to a taxi driver, what do you think that might result in? Okay, taxi driver is not my employee. They are a contractor. They are contracted to take me from point A to point B. There is absolutely no way that, you know, they will turn up in a pink bunny suit. So when we talk about contractors, they direct their own work. They supply their own, these are the tests. They supply their own material. If you have somebody who you are calling a contractor, however you pay them weekly, they do nine to five, um, you know, you supply them with the uniform, you direct how their work's going, they've got all of the, they're an employee and they're going to be deemed an employee. So be really careful about employment and what is truly a contractor and what is, you know, a, a sham contract in a sense because they are looking at, you know, they do, you know, there are consequences for it. Um, in terms of one of the other key areas, in a sense that, you know, employ, you need to be aware of is no misleading statements. If somebody on, your, on any of your pages makes a defamatory comment either about you or another product, um, you know, that does require you to at least send a cease and cease letter. Um, you know, you need to be aware of what people are saying. So I strongly suggest you have um, Google alerts for your business. 
Um, so that sort of brings us to the end of it. Um, what we so that's you know how you you can contact myself. I run the law firm Digital Age Lawyers. One of the things we do is we come in and well, I come in and we do something called a legal strategy session where we go through, in a sense, a legal order. Um, we generally charge 350 for that. For members of the chambers, we charge 275. It takes as long as it takes. You get a report and you get a plan of how to start to legally control and protect your business. So that's also there for members of the chamber. Uh, probably run out of time, but I'm happy if anybody has um, a question or so. Um, if you um, want to, oh, I'll stop sharing. And where's my little chat thing? Um, so, yeah, if anybody's got a question that they want to throw at me, happy to take a few. Have I shocked everybody and they've all gone to sleep? I'm uh, still awake. No. Hi. I'll Catherine. start pole dancing if you go to sleep. Hi, Catherine. I have a well a comment. Thank you very much. That was very informative. I, I will have a question, but I'll send it after yeah. about the contracts. And I guess when you have a verbal contract with somebody and you you essentially want to cash it in. Yep. Yep. And that's commonly what happens. So, yep, happy to help. OK, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And not even once inappropriate. I'm almost disappointed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't um, had a drink yet, that's why. Yeah, all right. I'll give you another hour. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, thank you. I hope everybody found that informative and um, you found a little nugget in there for your business or your big ideas. And uh, thank you for extending that offer to chamber members too, Catherine. That's really cool. Yep. It's a really helpful session for people to be able to go through. So, um, and just on a different note, uh, if you haven't booked in for our Chrissy party, get on it. It's on Tuesday. So um, we'd love to see you all. And uh, Catherine will be there. You can hit her up with all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks again. Thanks. Drink by drink. Yeah, <laughs> I'll shout you all a drink. <laughs> There's actually a bar tab. No. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you.